Ah yeah, so today's video is going to be episode 1 in a new series I'm doing called Predators Among Us. Um, it's going to be about a, um, a treatment centre for sexual deviants, sexual offenders. And um, it's going to be about three individuals who were all released in 1991. Um, they're all being committed um, because they'd raped children and women um, and for reasons I'll get into later in the video they were all released in 1991 when they were released they all went on to um, rape and kill again um so yeah i hope you enjoy it so this story links three horrific individuals who were all released from um massachusetts bridgewater treatment center for the sexually dangerous in 1991. now the center did have the power to lock people up indefinitely um and as I've just said, these three individuals were released and went on to commit even worse sexual crimes. This system completely failed the poor victims and the families. Um, so in 1991, other predators were released uh, from the treatment centre. Um, one of them... I'll be going into more detail within a little while. His name is called Michael Kelly. When he was released, he raped and murdered two women. Another one, um, Ronald Lefwitz, he got out and murdered a priest. Ralph Houghton got out in 1990 and raped a disabled 21 year old man. Wayne Chapman who I'll be going into more detail with in a little while. Um, he was a serial child rapist and he admitted to raping hundreds of children in many states across America. So the treatment centre was set up in the 1950s as a way of locking up sexual predators for life if need be. A caseworker who worked there for six years, Sean Summers, said, quote, it was a warehouse for sex offenders and it was necessary to keep people safe. Things changed, however, when the court decided that it needed to be run as a hospital instead of a, uh, instead of a prison. Therefore, treating the men as patients rather than prisoners. It didn't separate those who raped adults from those who raped children or gays from streets. So basically anything went there. Male on male sexual activity was prevalent and it was not discouraged by the staff. In fact, Sean Summers claims that there was sexual activity between the patients and the staff. Outsiders were brought in for family days and this was sponsored by the hospital to help rehabilitation. One of the paedophiles was running the pony rides for the children. This finally stopped following allegations of molestation. One predator, another one of the three I'm going to get into in a little minute, um, Nathaniel Barjona. He would get Sears catalog and he'd cut out pictures of children in the underwear and he'd hide them inside his Bible. Barjona chose to attend the Christian group rather than other treatment groups. Now each year patients had the right to petition the courts to be released. 
and the onus was on the state to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that the patient was still a threat. The best way to be released was to find two sympathetic psychologists. Nathaniel Barjona found two Christian ones. Dr. Richard Obar and Dr. Eric Switzer. The day Barjona was released, he turned round and he mooned a member of the staff. His mother had come to pick him up. When she seen him do this, she slapped him. During the 1980s and the 1990s, many predators were released. It has been claimed that these people were able to claim social security for their so-called disability. Some even bought homes. One person vended out a house he owned to staff at the hospital. Okay, so the first predator I'm going to be getting into is Nathaniel Bar Jonah. He was born David Paul Brown. A neighbour said that he had lots of little boys as friends and he attracted them to him by selling toys out of his garage. Now, paedophiles will make it their business to do anything and everything to be around children, to attract children to them. Um, the experts at it. In 1975, he abducted an 8-year-old, sexually assaulted him and strangled him. Then he abducted a 9-year-old girl. A witness to this wrote down his license plate number and he was arrested. Even though at the time he was on probation, his probation officers were not told. So... When his probation was completed, he actually received a letter thanking him for his cooperation. On September 24th, 1977, Bar Jonah convinced two boys to get into his car by claiming to be an undercover FBI agent. He took them to a secluded area where he strangled them. He jumped on the chest of one of them and almost killed him. At the time, Bar Jonah weighed 170 kilograms. He drove off with one boy still in the trunk. The boy he had left for dead regained consciousness and was able to get help, which led to the arrest of Bar Jonah. The boy he drove off with was luckily found alive in the trunk. Bar Jonah was convicted of attempted murder and he received 18 to 20 years in prison. He was then transported to Bridgewater State Hospital. On March 22nd, 1984, he changed his name from David Paul Brown to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Bar Jonah. Later that year, Superior Court Judge Walter E. Steele ruled that the state had failed to prove that he was a danger and he released Bar Jonah to Montana. During this time, he had actually confided to psychiatrists that he fantasises about abducting, murdering and cannibalising children. On August 9th, 1991, one month after being released from Bridgewater, he got inside a parked car where a seven-year-old boy was waiting for his mum. Bar Jonah sat on the child. He was arrested and admitted he did mean to kill the child. He was sentenced to probation in Montana. On February 6th, 1996, 
ten year old Zach Ramsey was walking to school alone and he was last seen in an alley. One witness said he had seen Zach get hit by a four door off white car. Another witness said they had seen him with an obese white man. Zach has never been found and he was declared legally dead in 2011. A police investigation determined that Bar Jonah had access to his mother's off-white four-door 1978 Toyota car the day the boy disappeared. At that time, his mum and brother were out of town. Sorry, out of town at a family funeral. Bar Jonah never went to work that day or the following days. Detectives found a list in Bar Jonah's apartment of names of his previous victims and Zach's name was there with died next to his name. A former roommate of Bar Jonah declared that he would mention the boy all the time. Detectives also found a coded notebook which was decoded by the FBI and it contained recipes which included children's body parts. When his garage was sprayed with a phosphorus chemical, the word TITA, spelled T-I-T-A, appeared, leading to the assumption that Bar Jonah was responsible for the death of James Tita, T-E-T-A. He was a Massachusetts boy who was kidnapped August. A Massachusetts boy who was kidnapped August 23rd, 1973. His body was found August 25th in New Hampshire. He had been raped and strangled. Bar Jonah was arrested again in 1999 for impersonating a police officer at an elementary school. He had a stun gun with him and pepper spray. Pictures of young boys were found in his home, as well as a bone from an unknown young male. Montana police charged him with kidnapping and sexual assault of four children. He was prosecuted for the abduction and molestation of three boys and he was convicted of kidnapping, aggravated assault and sexual assault, including charges that he had tortured one boy and hung him from the ceiling. 36-year-old Mary Patron was a witness and she ID'd him as the man who had attacked her in 1974. She was the nine-year-old girl. Unfortunately, the statues of limitations had expired by then. He is also a suspect in the abduction of seven-year-old Janice Pocket ten months earlier. He maintained his innocence until his death. He appealed the sentence in 2004, which thankfully failed. It's suspected that he cooked and ate Zach Ramsey. Bar Jonah often held cookouts for his neighbours and they would often say how horrible the meat was. But he'd just say, oh, it's venison. I, I hunted it myself. He was found inside the meat grinder in his home. The DNA came back as being that of an African-American male, but it did not belong to the same male as the bone found earlier. It is also said that he is guilty in the 1997 case of 14-year-old Amanda Gallion, 
who disappeared on the 13th of October on her way to school. She was often mistaken for the boy in her Gillette, Wyoming neighbourhood. Bar Jonah had arrived there on October 12th and he stayed in a motel. She, like many others, <coughs> were never seen again. But as a side note, I did come across an article about Amanda and it said that six days after she went missing, her 20-year-old boyfriend, Patrick Gearing, went missing too. First of all, what the hell is a 20-year-old man doing with a 14-year-old child? Secondly, it's hard to know what scenario is more likely, and we may never know. It's just sad. Bar Jonah died the 13th of April 2008. I hope he is rotten in hell. The second monster slash predator I want to talk about is called Michael Kelly. He's a convicted rapist who was released and went on to kill two women. He had promised one a job and he'd buried the other in his back garden. Now, Kelly had spent 13 years in prison but he was released after being declared not sexually dangerous. For his arraignments in Plymouth District Courthouse, he wore a bulletproof vest as police had been told of death threats. He had killed 21-year-old Colleen Coughlin and 24-year-old Deborah Levanji. The Department of Mental Health got Michael Kelly a job at the Plymouth Sign Company. The same department placed 21-year-old Colleen Coughlin next door. Days later, she vanishes. Now at the time, please don't go and talk to Kelly about the disappearance. But three months later, Deborah Levanji goes missing. They then question Kelly and they find Deborah's body in the sign shop. He admits to killing both women and takes the police to his home where he buried Colleen in his backyard. He had lured Deborah to the sign company with a promise of a job. He had beaten, raped, stabbed and strangled her. After being picked up in Florida for the traffic violation, he took police to his back garden where, through dental records, they confirmed they had found Colleen. Colleen's sister said her sister was a victim of the system. Six of the women came forward to say he had tried to take them back to the isolated office where they worked. One said she was raped, but had managed to escape. He was sent to Bridgewater for the 20-day psychiatric evaluation after that. Michael Kelly was put in charge of running the canteen where you could buy everything other than women and children. In the 1970s, Kelly had been convicted of raping two women and he was jailed for 13 years at Bridgewater. In June 1991, Kelly was released by three specialists, a review board and a judge, and he was paroled. Paula Erickson was part of the review board which let dangerous predators out. 
<clears throat> she says that she tried to prevent Kelly from being released. One of his doctors had said it was easy to be fooled by the most skilled psychopaths. This doctor also believes that treatment can work. What I would say is, considering it was left up to these individuals whether or not to do treatment, how can it possibly work? In 1990, the legislator, sorry, the legislator barred prisoners being sent to Bridgewater. But at the time, there was more than 200 held there. Many think these people can't be fixed. And if we accept that paedophilia is a sexual preference, then it really can't be changed. And we all know that rape is about power and domination. Kelly was a model patient, apparently. He cried when he was meant to. He played the system. He bought a home. He got married and he had his own children. I'd like to know if his wife knew who he really was. The third predator I want to discuss. Is no better. His name is Wayne Chapman. Wayne Chapman worked in a hospital incinerating waste. In his spare time, he liked to stalk little boys. He'd record himself in one recording. He's heard saying, quote, Right now, I am passing two paper boys. One is about eight years old. End quote. Another recording, he says, Several school buses passing me now. Boy, would I love to get into some of the stuff on them buses. Wow, woo. He would take pictures of potential and actual victims. He ran a club for boys and he molested them in Providence. One victim to this day is still heavily medicated and broken, claims a friend who was also molested by Chapman. He said that Chapman would prey on the most vulnerable and lonely children. And that's the thing with um, with pedophiles. Um, they go on the they go after the weakest, those who have got troubled home lives, those who haven't got someone looking out for them. Chapman was found by accident after a routine police check in 1976. Police found hundreds of pictures of naked little boys. He admitted to molesting hundreds of little boys and he tied them up in the woods. He is the suspect in a 1976 disappearance of 10 year old Andy Puglisi from Lawrence. There is an award winning documentary called Have You Seen Andy? that was made by a childhood friend. Her name is Melanie Perkins McLaughlin. He was charged with murder of a five year old boy but the case was dropped because they didn't have a body. The police investigating this case believed that because he was being sent to Bridgewater, which, remember, had the power to keep people for life, the police believed that he would never be released, so they never fought the case. Paula Erickson, 
a therapist. Said that he refused to do any and all therapy. Instead, he chose the religious route. The two therapists who helped Bar Junior get out also helped Wayne Chapman get out too. They stated that he'd undergone a religious experience, saying that on open days he was exposed to children and he had no sexual thoughts regarding them. So are these two therapists mind readers? Just this case is so frustrating. The state said he was dangerous, but that he's improved. The report concluded that treatments had long-term effects on change in behaviour. The judge sided with Chapman, saying, Wayne Chapman has no history of injury to his victims. Even though the first time he went to jail was because he tied a child to the tree and set him on fire. But yeah, that didn't cause any injury apparently. Who were these judges and therapists and psychiatrists and doctors? I think they are paedophiles to be honest. He was deemed too dangerous to be released after his prison sentence for raping two boys expired in 2004. Now that he's in his 70s, he's been deemed by the courts again to be too frail to be a threat. So after 40 years in prison, Wayne Chapman was released from prison in August 2019, even though he is a convicted child rapist. As a boy, Wayne Chapman tortured cats and he killed them with bricks. He would also put them in enclosed boxes and leave them to die in the woods of starvation. He tried to molest his 11-year-old stepson and he molested another 12-year-old boy in the woods. In 2015, prison guards had said that he was still capable of sexual functioning. In 2018, he had been accused of exposing himself to a prison staff member where he was found to be not guilty. Back in the 1970s, Wayne Chapman himself had said he needs help because he can't help himself from doing these things. He's a level 3 sex offender. What came out in this case was the hospital were releasing Wayne Chapman for days at a time because he was a model inmate. He was picking up sex workers which the therapists thought was good because they were adults. I'd say, well, worthy. There's a lot of children out there on the streets selling the bodies and it's not their fault. But I'd like to say to the staff, if you weren't with him, how do you know the age of the person he was picking up? F- fucking joke. <sighs> I know this has been heavy, but I think it's important. To conclude, anyway. At one point, the treatment centre was housing people that had been taken there for drug and alcohol dependency. They hadn't committed any crime whatsoever. And I found a Harvard Law article that stated that, luckily, on July 18th, 2017, the Department of Corrections agreed to remove 14 men who were not sexual offenders, they were just addicts from this centre. This is horrific to think that they did this, considering that many people with substance problems 
have a history of sexual abuse. Certainly victims of some kind of abuse, physical, domestic, whatever it may be. And to put these people that are just not well with dangerous sexual offenders is just a crime. Luckily, the, there was a lot of civil complaints made against um, Bridgewater and the Department of Corrections. Looking for um, photos for this was difficult. I don't know why. Um, maybe because the cases are probably classed as old now. Um, so I got a lot of the pictures from um, a documentary I watched, which I will link. Um, I also want to give a shout out to a blog I found called True Crime Cases Blogspot dot com. I used some of their pictures of Bar Jonah, um, and they also included pictures of Zach Ramsey as well. Um, so I will link that down below as well and I'd like to thank them for you know for the blog it's really informative um I'm gonna link everything I've used um in the description box so um you know if you want to find out more um you know help yourselves like I said I know this has been a heavy case but it's one I really felt was important to make. Um, so thank you all for your time. Um, take care of yourselves and each other. Any questions or concerns, just leave me a comment and I'll get back to you. Um, so yeah, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-da.